Hey everyone, welcome to the Incubator Podcast. I'm your co-host Aaron Boyd. And this is Sabir Saran. Welcome to the show. Today we are excited to bring on Chris McHenry of Aviatrix. Now you might ask who is Aviatrix and we're going to get right into it. But at a top level view, Aviatrix simplifies multi-cloud networking. They were founded about 2014, uh, have about $350 million or so in funding to date. Chris can correct us in, if we're, in a minute if we're, if we're off there, but uh, amazing pedigree of talent that is built up uh, on, on this company. And I think that it's prime time for everyone to understand how networking is evolving and, and what Aviatrix's role is in it. But without further ado, uh, welcome, Chris. If you, you wouldn't mind introducing uh, a little bit about uh, talking to us a little bit about your background and introducing Aviatrix. Yeah, thank you very much. And I am super excited to be here. I uh, always love just chatting about the industry and 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 we're going to have some fun today. A uh, little bit about myself. So I, I had product management at Aviatrix. Uh, so it, it, it's it's a really, really fun space. And I'm just incredibly excited to and honored to have the opportunity to build something and, and to really help help customers out here. But um, it's 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 also interesting reflecting on you know, how I got here. I've been here for about two years. Uh, but but leading up to that, my, my background is long time in the networking and network security space and uh, spent about 15 years at Cisco before this um, and was, you know, covering the whole portfolio for a while, working with a lot of different teams. And during that period of time, I actually worked with, I think, four or five different business units. And, and it, it's fun, too, because I think one of the challenges, to be honest, in some of the legacy networking vendor worlds is that um, they're so big now that they get to be siloed when one of the things that customers would really would benefit customers is some convergence, actually, in their ability to operate uh, some of these different domains. Uh, but I had the privilege of spending time in a lot of different groups. And and over the last 10 years or so, my specialization really has been in data center SDN, uh, micro segmentation. I joined the NCMA team uh, relatively early on at Cisco, worked with ACI um, shortly after that, you know, uh, there was a huge focus on, on micro segmentation, right? I mean, I think that, that really has been an aspirational target for people for a long time, really driving, you know, thinking differently about security, uh, from something that has largely been reactive up until this point, uh, built around the idea of, of finding threats, um, which is a constantly evolving landscape and uh, a bit of a needle in the haystack and moving towards this posture of zero trust. And uh, and micro segmentation was, was here to support that. Uh, but we learned relatively quickly on that uh, the problem with micro segmentation is not just the ability to enforce a zero trust policy. It is um, one of the bigger problems is actually what is that policy and how do I how do I figure that out in a brownfield environment? How do I maintain it and manage it? And you know what we're looking at nowadays is how do we how do we unify it across multiple different enforcement planes? How do we how do we transition it to policy as code? How do we empower developers in those spaces? But we learned pretty quickly at Cisco that we needed to help customers in this area of policy management. So I joined another team. Cisco, this is my first like real beginning to end kind of startup experience, even though it was inside of a big company. And that was with the Cisco Tetration product, which evolved into an agent-based uh, micro segmentation tool, really focused around security, actually moved over and is now a part of Cisco's security business group, which I think is you know, the, the, the right thing. And that's kind of the challenge here, right, is that firewalling and segmentation really even when we get to some of the practical elements of when it works and when it doesn't work for organizations, it is um, it doesn't sit in the typical silos, right? It's part networking, part security, part app teams. There's a lot of stakeholders there. Um, and then uh, and then after that, I, I was really really interested in cloud, and we were starting to extend that product into cloud. And obviously, cloud was gaining some critical momentum and critical mass. And so I, I moved into um, what Cisco at the time called the cloud networking business unit, or I just rebranded it to that. And I was responsible for a lot of the software products in that space, including um, one of their products that they were working on that was 
was looking at uh, networking inside of AWS and Azure and GCP. And I had this aha moment, which was like, holy crap. Um, you know, I've been doing networking for 15 years now. Uh, one of the first things I learned was dynamic routing protocols. And, uh, and you're asking me to go into this cloud and configure static routes. This is, this is ridiculous. <laughs> this is backwards. Uh, and what I, super interesting, we can talk about like how the clouds got there and, and why that's the case. And then I learned AWS and then I learned Azure and I was like, man, these things are totally different. How in the world is an enterprise? going to be able to manage this thing. And I started researching, like, what does the industry think about cloud networking? And Aviatrix just came, you know, kept popping up. And I was like, seen this pattern before. I've seen this pattern of innovation. Like these guys, I know this space. These guys have something really special here. I got to figure out a way to get over there. And I've been here for about a year and a half. And uh, it's been an incredible ride. Um, really, uh, one of the things that we're doing is, I, I, do, I believe, um, I know one of the things we wanted to talk about today was segmentation, but I believe that there is a convergence in the industry between networking and network security. And uh, you can see this in a lot of different places, right? Coming from a couple different directions. I was walking through uh, the San Jose airport a couple months ago, and uh, there's an ad for Cisco. And, and I think their tagline was something like, if it's connected, it's protected, right? Go, go, go to any, go to any one of these vendors, right? I mean, I'm, I don't care about the reality of that statement, right? <laughs> Are they executing against it? I don't know. But, um, you know, go to Fortinet's website. They're talking about security, but they have switches and routers and all these other kinds of things. Go look at the top SD-WAN players and half of them are firewall vendors. And this is, it makes so much sense. We've been trying to do this for, for 10 to 20 years. Um, and if the network uh, could actually uh, implement effective security controls, uh, man, we could make a huge impact on improving customer security postures. And the cloud is a perfect place to do that because we're not tied to hardware and we can truly move into this software world. And so that's a big part of what we do here at Aviatrix. You know, we, we, we like to call our ourselves secure cloud networking, which is really that blend of networking and network security and, and helping organizations tame um, what started out oftentimes as a bit of a shadow IT project in the cloud, but really bringing that uh, that enterprise rigor and that enterprise security and doing it in a way that still keeps the best parts of the cloud, the agility, the flexibility, the scalability, all of that kind of stuff. That That's our mission here. Um, and it's it's fun. So maybe a little bit longer of an answer no, no. than you had expected, <laughs> but that's uh, that's a little bit about me and and what we're doing over here at Aviatrix. Yeah, I think you. Uh, I think you teed up. Like, there's a lot in what you just said in that intro of something we need to decompose, and and there's so much value that you've layered on on top of these these uh, multi cloud providers. But I I want to wade in slowly here because there, it is a big subject, um, and you have so many capabilities in this space. So, if I'm to wade in, if we look at one of the things you said was. Uh, look at these CSPs. They all have their own standards. They all have their own interfaces. They all have their own approaches, their philosophies, their own primitives, um, and the way they do things. They also innovate at different paces, et cetera. How does, how does uh, Aviatrix look at that world and maintain this interoperability, even between these disparate providers, as maybe a starting point? And then we'll get into the security elements, the, the optimization elements, the additional telemetry, because to your point, yeah. there is so much you have added on top as, uh, as that overlay um, to bring a better experience. But I just want to start with this idea of every one of these CSPs is, um, is approaching things somewhat differently. Uh, yeah. And you're bringing this very simplified standard to management. Um, so can you talk us through a little bit about um, how you approach that? Yeah, absolutely. It, it, it's a really interesting question, right? Because um, while the approaches are different, and I think you mentioned the primitives are different, which is like one of the really important pieces, um, and the outcomes that enterprises are looking for are, are, are often the same, right? We need connectivity, we need isolation, we need security, we need visibility, we need all of these different different pieces. And, uh, and it really starts to get crazy when you dig into the nuances of how each of these different clouds work. Because yeah, okay, of, of course, everybody's going to do routing, but like in AWS, when you deploy an application by default, it does not have access to the internet in Azure, 
It does, right? Those are two like fundamentally different security postures. Um, and they're all evolving at the same time. So in that exact same, you know, in that exact same example, uh, last week, Azure came out and said that they're switching that, right? And you've got until 2025 to fix it. And so, you know, keeping on top of all of these things is, um, it would be incredibly difficult uh, for an individual enterprise to accomplish. And especially uh, for an enterprise, it's incredibly difficult to do it with the same staff that you have. And I remember a conversation that I was having with one of our customers, one of the large Blue Cross Blue Shield organizations. And uh, we were sitting down and a lot of people like to say they're not going to be multi-cloud. And then in fact, we have this a lot. <laughs> we'll go to a customer and say, hey, we're not going to be multi-cloud. You know, we'll, we're just going to specialize. We'll be experts in it. And then they come back six months later and say, oh, well, we had an acquisition or, you know, and <laughs> Hey, OpenAI changed the game. We're going to Azure, right? All those, there's always a, the, 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 the drivers come, but I remember sitting down with these guys and they've got three people on their team and uh, they've, got a, they've got a network architect, they've got a security architect, and they've got, a, they've got an ops guy. And, uh, and so the business comes and says, hey, you guys need to support AWS, Azure, and GCP. And they had a decision to make. So do we take those same, because the answer was not hire more people. The answer was, you know, to take either take those same three people, make one of them a full stack expert in AWS, one of them a full stack ex expert in, in Azure, or one of them a full stack experts in GCP. Um, or you find a tool to help you standardize across each of the three different clouds. And so to some extent, that's that's we'll talk about the how we do what we do. Um, but I think the the why is really important as well. Like we're there to help organizations operate uh, and, 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 and be able to give the business the best of what each of these three clouds are providing with the same staff that they have, right? And the same level of expertise uh, that they have today. So, so how do you do that, right? I mean, one is we have an entire company that's focused on delivering that for customers. Um, but the second thing is that uh, we need to be able to, the, the term we use is embrace and extend, right? Um, we want to embrace the best capabilities of the clouds that exist today, and we want to extend them where we need to. And so one of the really unique things about uh, the way that we approach solving multi-cloud networking is that our, our, our SDN, uh, because we, that's essentially what we are, is we're, we're an SDN, a uh, controller-based SDN. But it's a combination of deep integration and orchestration capabilities with cloud-native constructs and overlaying an Aviatrix software-defined network on top of the cloud where it makes sense. And that allows us to really bring a standardized experience and a standardized set of capabilities independent of the cloud. Like typically what you'll see is that we onboard the customer to the Aviatrix SDN at the edge of, you know, the, of, you know in the cloud we have these concepts of VNets or VPCs or whatever they are. They're you know, similar to like VLANs. In a traditional data center, it's that first hop out. When you hit that first hop, that's where you typically hit the Aviatrix SDN. And that means that we can really provide a standardized set of capabilities independent of where the cloud is, uh, because at that point it's running through our software. So that combination of orchestration and, and actually uh, having uh, software-defined networking capabilities that run inside of the cloud gives us the ability to standardize and really up-level uh, the cloud native capabilities while presenting a singular network experience to the customer. Yeah, there's, um, and, and if we want to talk scale, um, I don't know, you know, Aviatrix has 550 plus enterprise customers, um, really, really <laughs> big names, really, really reputable name. names. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and so like that value has, has been noticed and that value has been embraced um, but you said something else too, which is up level. You're yes. adding so much capability on top of what a native uh, cloud solution can provide. Everything from some pretty deep and interesting um, uh, path optimization techniques, mm -hmm. some ML-based anomaly and threat um, threat mitigation mm -hmm. techniques. Um, we're talking about um, uh, additional telemetry that you can collect. Um, so there, there's lots of, of things we can do beyond just segmentation. Can you walk us through some of uh, what you're providing in that space, I gave a little vignette, but some yeah. of why it's not just the simplification, that in itself pays for the show, 
but you're, you're adding so much capability beyond. Of course. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I think is interesting is it, it, we've seen a trend actually, and you, you mentioned big logos. In fact, that's, that's one of our, it, it's interesting. We have a lot of really reputable name brands in our, in, 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 in our customer base. And, and it's, it's because what we see is when you, um, when you start to really get you know, uh, a lot of your workloads in the cloud, that complexity starts to come into play. And there's a lot of different drivers for the complexity. And so um, we like to say that, uh, you know, there's there's different ranges of cloud maturity. And and oftentimes, you know, co customers come to us early, uh, they'll look at it and say, ah, oh, I can do it natively. And then they'll come back to us about 18 months later and say, okay, 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 I give up. Let's go, let's go do it. But um, we're also seeing an interesting trend when that complexity happens that early on, um, in in the life cycle of cloud, it was largely driven by application developers. And um, the clouds tried to create their primitives in a way that they were really simple and app developers are networking experts. And so that's how you get like some of the easy buttons for connectivity to the internet and all of that kind of stuff. But we've actually seen a trend uh, relatively recently that aligns with that growth in critical mass where the traditional networking and network security teams are coming into the cloud now and they're either uh, you know applying security policy building a perimeter you know building you know network segmentation or actually taking over operational elements of the network and when that happens uh, we see them wanting the same tools that they had on prem to do things like troubleshooting performance monitoring, being able to do basic things like a trace route or a packet capture or, you know, and and another like real challenge with the cloud is that for better or for worse, like there's good things and bad things about this, but um, the, the the cloud is, is oftentimes very siloed. So if you as a large organization have, um, you know, a hundred different applications and you have a hundred different application teams, each of those application teams is going to have a separate account. Now imagine, because the network is one thing, it's the thing that connects everything together. Now you've got a network administrator. And uh, not only do you have to figure out which, you know, what part of the network does that particular application sit in when you get your trouble ticket opened up, you now also have to figure out what account it is and do I have privileges in that account? And can I grab, a, you know, what do I spin up to, to, to install Wireshark on and all of this other kind of stuff that, again, very complex processes and, and made even, even more complicated. So having that centralized place um, where we can give the network teams the operational tools uh, that they're used to with some of the best networks on-prem, right? We're taking lessons learned from 30 years of networking and 10 years of SDN with deep visibility, deep troubleshooting capabilities, embedded security, um, you know, and uh, even doing advanced things like one of, one of the big drivers for advanced routing uh, is really where I'm going with this. One of the big drivers that we find that creates complexity is when uh, security is a requirement. And so uh, for a long time, and, and if we dive in more to segmentation, we can talk about this in more detail, but for a long time, um, what we've been seeing is a trend where the security team say, whoa, 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 I need my firewalls, give me my Palo Alto, give me my checkpoint, give me my Fortinet. And I don't know if you guys ever, you know, on-prem, this was super easy, right? We had a physical cable to the internet and you go plug the thing in and then the traffic comes in one side and it goes out the other side. Well, I mean, how do you, how do, you do that in the cloud? It's all, it's all logical, it's service insertion, it's policy-based routing, it's a lot of these like super complex things that we used to do in networks on-prem. Um, nobody loves service insertion in any SDN that I've ever, ever heard of, right? But it's literally the only way to put a firewall uh, into the cloud. And so we've got a feature called FireNet, which um, the demo I like to do is, you know, if, you, if we're doing a trial with a customer, I, I can get your Palo Altos deployed in 20 minutes with traffic inserted in your, you know, in, in, in literally pick the cloud, like pick a cloud, don't even tell me beforehand, we'll go do it, right? And that's kind of the, um, you know, so so uh, applying security is is one of the core drivers that that influences complexity and, and causes customers to come to us. Uh, we also have a patented technology um, called high performance encryption. Uh, there's a challenge in doing encryption in software in the cloud because it's all CPU driven, whereas on prem we used to offload that to custom hardware. Uh, you can you typically max out about a gig and a half 
uh, or 1.25 gigabits per second of performance. Um, our patent allows us to do that in software at 10, 20, 50 gigabits per second. So we can do things like saturating direct connect links, um, you know, up to the cloud and doing that in a way that's resilient and performant. So again, lot, lots of different pieces here, right? That, that help customers adopt an enterprise grade cloud network. Yeah, a lot to unpack there, Chris. Um, so maybe we can go down this path with um, in two ways. One is uh, from the opposite end. So we talk, we approach things right now from like a, a network ex, uh, experience, if you will, uh, of traditional networking and how you build up towards the cloud. Now, what about if you're on the opposite end as a, a development team, an application team, or the and let's call it the developer experience. Um, mm -hmm. and you don't want to have anything to do with, with, uh, networking. So what is mm -hmm. that abstraction experience, uh, aspect that Aviatrix can support, uh, as a result of your platform and your offerings, and then we'll get into segmentation. Yeah. Great, great question. So, I mean, I think that's another piece, right? Is, uh, in fact, a lot of our buyers are, are cloud buyers and there's things that you have to do as as a, and operators, right? There's things that you have to do, um, you know, as a cloud first company that I think we do really, really well. So, uh, you know, our Terraform provider is we've got full coverage. We oftentimes release um, Terraform versions prior or features. Uh, we include features in our Terraform provider before they're even shipping in the rest of our core software. I mean, that API first, developer friendly, you know, infrastructure as code first a process, I think, has been. Um, you know, a, a big reason why we've been so successful in that space. Uh, we also want to drive the complexity out of having to understand a lot about routing and looking more at intent-based networking, being able to carve up the network into these different domains without thinking about route tables or anything like that, right? And so a lot of that simplicity is really abstraction uh, and, and and focused more on that intent uh, style model of networking. Should this thing talk to this other thing or not? And and we we deal with the complexity there, and that that lines up very closely with I think the things that developers you know want to accomplish out of this. But I think one of the more interesting pieces, in my opinion, is uh, maybe a little philosophical, but there's a lot of practical results from it. And that is, uh, no one would say to a developer that lifting and shifting an application is the best way to move it to the cloud, right? We do it, it's not the most cost efficient, it's not the most performant, it's not the most resilient. And each of the clouds have these, um, these concepts that they call well-architected frameworks. And they're generally the same across each of the different clouds, but they essentially say, hey, if you re-architect an app, here's all the benefits that you can expect to get, to get from that. Uh, and so developers want that experience. They want, they want an app that has been optimized for the cloud. And when I look at what I think we've done with networking and network security is we didn't take an on-prem product like an existing firewall and just package up and put it in a virtual machine and ship it into the cloud. And a lot of what we did was we took networking and network security and we thought, what if I were to refactor this and re-architect it in a cloud first way and then and then put that into the cloud. And so one of the really, really interesting examples of this is a, um, a feature that we released. It's really, you know, we, we, our, our product is a platform. You can consume little pieces of it here and there, right? So it's kind of, you could kind of call this a product. You could kind of call this platform, but it's really all part of the same thing. Uh, we released this earlier this year, this uh, what we call the distributed cloud firewall. And what distributed cloud firewall is, is it allows you to take the concept of a traditional, you know, application layer firewall. Um, I don't like calling them next generation firewalls because that was their next generation like 15 years ago. Traditional firewall, whatever you want to call it, and um, and 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 instead distribute that out and push that network security closer to the application. So now we have a horizontally scalable, resilient you know, burstable, performant, like there's so many, so many benefits of it. Like it, the, the, the number that I usually throw out is when you really do the math on this, we have significantly smaller failure domains than a traditional firewall would. And we have about 14 X price to performance ratio. Why? 
because we scaled the firewall out, right? That's how cloud is supposed to be designed. And so from a developer perspective, um, what we're not asking them to do is we're not asking them to re-architect their network to take a legacy architecture and, and essentially force that upon them. Instead, we're meeting them where they are with a well-architected set uh, of network and network security tools that align with the operational model that they want to support. And that, that, that aligns for both connectivity, visibility, security. We'll talk a little bit about policy as code as well and, and tying into their existing workflows and things along those lines. But that's really the approach that we take. So this is interesting. So you've given the facility for, um, call it all stakeholders in an organization to interact with. Um, yes. So my next question would be, how does this practically come together? When we have InfoSec, which may have their own interests on, on you know, adhering to GDPR and, and CCP, CCPA, et cetera, um, everything you said about encryption and making sure that we're mm -hmm. routing in the right place and storing in the right place, you've got the network team that is responsible for elements of this. And now we have the developer who potentially has more control and all of it can be deployed via Terraform, uh, yep. managed via Terraform. How does this all practically come together so that people don't stomp on each other, that it works in unison? Uh, what are some of those patterns look like? And that's a great practical question. I'll tell you, that is like one of the core things that I think about as we're designing and, 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 um, and building the product is what does that, what do those abstraction layers look like? What do the divisions of roles look like? Um, you know, what do we can, hey, theoretically, if there was one person operating this network, I would converge everything, but that's not practical because organizations have different silos, right? And so, um, you know, when we, uh, just as an example, um, and one of the things that uh, we do with, this, with the security policy side of the product is it's kind of isolated in its own UI, it's isolated in its own Terraform objects. And when you create a security policy, one of the things you don't have to do is determine where it gets enforced on the network. Right. So you actually have to have zero knowledge of the underlying network itself in order to define and manage security policy. Right. It's it's and 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 it's it's those kinds of things that allow us to align um, with kind of the organizational structures. Another good example would be um, we do a lot with tags. We have this concept. Um, so when we start talking about. When you think about segmentation, but this is actually relevant in, in a number of different places. I talked about this early on, the policy management piece being a problem for segmentation. Um, policy, if you break it down, is really two things. It is who are you and what are you allowed to do? So the who we generally refer to as identity. And, uh, and most people, when they think about identity, they think about like Active Directory or Okta or something along those lines, but that's not apps. Like an app doesn't have a AD group. It has, you know, tags. It has, I, you know, it is what, what app am I a part of? What role do I have? What data classification am I in, right? And we actually didn't have good sources of that on-prem. I like go ask anybody whether they felt like their CMDB was good and Oh, I've never heard anybody say yes to that question. Right? Um, but in the cloud, uh, tagging is much more prevalent. And, um, and what's interesting about it is uh, it has uh, joint incentives. So you are incentivized to tag correctly because you can look at cost and build back. You're, you can do things like adding a machine to an auto scaling group. You can prevent things from being deleted. Uh, so what if we just tied on to those tags as a form of identity that already have a set of mutually beneficial incentives applied to them and use those to also do things like security policy or connectivity policy or building application performance dashboards, things along those lines. So what's interesting about that is the developer now has some level of control over you know, their security policy without even having to, to write a ticket, right? Half of Firewall change management requests are update this IP address in this particular, you know, security group. And that goes away entirely because if the developer tags the machine correctly, they automatically inherit the security and the connectivity policy. So it's not just separating things in the UI. It's looking at the workflows that are already in place and thinking about how we can tie into those workflows and leverage them to support the outcomes that we're trying to deliver. So it's a great question. Now, one more thing that I'll add to this is, um, and this is just very practical uh, from, from an organizational perspective. Um, 
one place I see organizations go wrong in these exercises is that um, they expect perfect outcomes and they don't do a good job of breaking down the individual steps that can make meaningful improvements in their architecture and aligning those by level of effort and to be very candid, minimizing the number of groups that are involved, right? So um, you, you really need to be conscious of how everybody is incentivized and what their day jobs are and all that kind of stuff. And the cloud is very interesting. And I think my favorite example of this in the cloud is on-prem, micro-segmentation was, was like the next frontier, right? We had these giant data centers and most of them were deployed with flat networks and you know, you get ransomware and your entire application environment goes down and that was a problem. So we did micro -seg. In the cloud, um, we're not even there yet. Uh, the number of customers that I see that don't have basic internet perimeter security controls is crazy to me, right? Um, like don't have any inbound security and don't have any outbound security no visibility into what it's consuming on the internet. Um, I generally, in, in the cloud, you kind of got to break the security problem up into three different buckets. So you got to look at it like ingress security, what do I do with inbound traffic? Egress security, what do I do with outbound traffic in east-west? Um, and you can break that up. You can actually build kind of a matrix with this too, where it's um, trusted and untrusted. So I've got a, a trusted user going to a trusted application, trusted user go to an untrusted application. You know, kind of that that matrix and, and literally each one of those buckets you might have a slightly different solution for so I'll give an example sassy um sassy is a trusted user either going to untrusted application or trusted application right um and it's an amazing innovation right it solves uh the challenge of users leaving the office and now i don't have that physical firewall anymore and i need to i need to apply security uh, in the cloud, uh, one of the unique things about the cloud is that the, that first part typically tar starts with trusted application, right? So it's either user coming into an application or a trusted application talking to another another application. Um, so when we break the problem down in that sense, uh, micro segmentation like, like, like that's that, that's out there, right? Like I should go for the perimeter security first, right? And I should look at you know how do we get WAF as an example, or look at something like Cloudflare or Akamai or one of those hosted solutions to protect my, my ingress. And then, and then second to that, um, I am a, like, I think egress security is one of the easiest ways to start improving your security posture. It's incredibly important. Uh, when you think about zero trust and you think about applications communicating with other applications or APIs or even other services in the cloud, it's not just inside your environment, it's also outside your environment, and maybe more importantly, it's outside your environment, right? And uh, and so back to your initial question, which is um, how, do we, how do we work among teams? Um, picking the right thing to go for that avoids disruption to other teams is an important part of this process. And so egress security, one reason why I love it is because it's very minimally disruptive to the developer. It primarily only, you could have a single, you could, the security team could literally come in and do it by themselves, right? Very minimally disruptive to the network, very minimally disruptive to the developer. And the way that we architect the solution, at least, um, you, can, you can do it with one, one team, which gives you much faster time to value. Chris, I think about this a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's well crafted though. Very well crafted. I like how yeah. you put that. So, um, as you said, you might start with uh, with the perimeter aspect of things. But so, if if the focus is on segmentation and um, everything we talked about, the developer experience and everything like that, what would be your approach or suggested approach to building defense and depth layers towards zero trust? Where does Aviatrix yeah. or how far does Aviatrix go, and where does one pick up on on different um, maybe different approaches thereof. That would be yeah. helpful. So I'll say this, our general domain right now is the cloud, right? Um, so, you know, it, 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 you, you had mentioned like the Nirvana scenario of an end-to-end solution that is working in the hybrid cloud. And, you know, I, th I think we'll, we'll get there. And when you think about the evolution of hybrid cloud as well, you know, you could look at what, what VMware has done with their 
with their products, you could argue that the data center is just another cloud now. And I'm not saying we won't go there. We might, but um, but generally, right now, where we're looking at is is that cloud environment and that multi cloud environment. Uh, and we we support AWS, Azure, GCP, Oracle, Alibaba uh, today. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, we actually are also uh, adding just added support for Equinix as well. I see Equinix as a interesting specialty cloud. Uh, so there's there's some cool traffic engineering uh, impacts to that as well. But um, but within the cloud, um, we want to go full stack, right? On prem, there was I think a um, a split between threat, zero trust, micro segmentation, perimeter, all these other kinds of things. At the end of the day, one of the biggest problems about segmentation is policy management. And it, 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 if I've got two or three or four places where I need to enforce policy or multiple different controls, that is a barrier to entry. And literally, success in micro segmentation is, it, it, there is no magic button. Um, it is about taking all the little things and, and trying to minimize as many barriers as you possibly can. So if I can abstract, if I got three policy places and I can abstract them into one, um, that's, that, that helps me do more with micro segmentation and make a bigger, make a bigger impact. So um, we see this as, uh, as a, the, the way to do this is that, that, that we need to abstract that in the cloud for customers. And at the end of the day, it should just be about defining a policy that, that, that says this thing can talk to this thing in this way over these ports and protocols with this URL or whatever it is, right? And because we have that combination that I talked about earlier of being able to orchestrate the cloud as well as insert our own software, if the controller sees that that particular policy should be enforced within the same subnet, we can take over the security groups. We can take over the native controls. But the the act the policy administrator doesn't have to know how the policy is being enforced. We abstract that for the customer. So if you want to use Aviatrix to drive very granular micro segmentation, or you want us to be, you know, um, maybe you're not doing micro segmentation everywhere, but you want to have a kill switch for quarantines and across all of your accounts, across all of your clouds at any point in time, like absolutely in scope of uh, of what we're actually delivering today. Let her, you know, we. This this kind of hybrid between east west macro egress micro all of that kind of stuff, um, we want to unify all of that into a single policy model that says you know that's intent based, that's identity driven, um, and and so that that eliminates one of those barriers to entry. Now more more practically, um, as organizations start to approach defense in depth, I also view this as a prioritization thing. So uh, we deliver, um, one of the things that we deliver is on top of the clouds is we deliver a lot of real-time you know, network traffic visibility, flow visibility, um, context information about uh, where the different machines live. So being able to uh, do things like policy discovery, policy testing, you know, that's, uh, those are some things that we're building out. We do have full zero trust policy discovery today for egress. So you can put Aviatrix in place, and I can automatically discover the zero trust policy for your perimeter. Um, but when you think about uh, micro segmentation, prioritization is really important. And so I, I went down the visibility path because one of the things that is important to understand is um, where are those pivot points? What are the things that if an attacker were to get in and they compromised a particular system, we call these the crown jewels. Maybe it's a database. Maybe it's an Active Directory server, you know, something in in the shared services domain that has access to a lot of different things. Those are the places where you should start, and uh, and so I generally recommend um, zero trust is aspirational. Uh, we should prioritize defense in depth based on impact, because inherently, the more granular you get, the more effort, the more policy you have, the more effort you need you you have to put into maintaining that policy. So prioritization is really, really important. It shouldn't be everything everywhere all at once. Um, I want customers to make progressive and meaningful impact, positive impacts on their security posture. So crown jewels, it's a very common kind of uh, concept in the industry in terms of how to prioritize micro segmentation and segmentation in general, but understand using visibility to understand where those points are and then prioritize them appropriately, I think is, 
is one of the best ways to get started. Chris, um, you talked a lot about intent-based um, uh, networking or intent-based policy networking, right? Yep. So how is that intent or how is that policy, what is, I guess, effective or accurate enough um, to say, okay, you have new workloads or anything like that that are, that are, that are coming up and this is yep. the way that this, sh- uh, there's the standard set of maybe controls that are applied, but how do we ensure it's the right, right one for that workload? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of that, okay, so the, the optimal workflow here and the customers that I have seen that have been, I'm not talking about just the most successful, I'm talking about the exponentially most successful customers with micro-segmentation empower the developers to manage their policy, mm-hmm. right? And uh, and provide at the same time guardrails on top of that. So you've got a, essentially layered, but logical controls. So the security team has a set of controls that they can provide that says, hey, we're gonna manage um, whether something can talk to the internet or not, but you're gonna manage who it can talk to on the internet, or we're gonna manage who can talk to this centralized shared database, but, um, you know, you have to poke a hole on your side as well. So there's like, I call that the two key turn model, right? That the you know, developers essentially have to agree in order to um, to have any policy uh, put in place. But that concept of policy as code um, and that empowering of the developers to manage their own policies, which by the way, they're doing some of today with security groups and network security groups and all that kind of stuff. So giving them the toolkit to do that at a more macro level, um, I, I'm, it, it, I, I'm, I'm not kidding, 10x more successful customers. Um, that is the differentiator of moving towards a policy as code model. Now it's hard um, and it will get messy and you still have challenges with troubleshooting. And so the, having the right tools in place to support that are critically important. Um, you know, but that, that's how we're building our software, right? You know, we talked about Terraform, we talked about visibility, we talked about intent-based policies. Uh, empowering the developers to manage their policies really is the, is the true solution to that. Now, there are middle grounds, right? If you're not ready for that, and a lot of organizations aren't, um, again, there's baby steps we can take. So the idea of using tags that the developers are already managing as a mechanism for defining policies, incredibly powerful, right? We should not be using IP addresses in the cloud to write firewall policy, period, right? It's even worse in the cloud because the developer is going to come in and they're going to say, hey, I got a new version of my app. What do they do? They don't upgrade it in place. They destroy it. They rebuild it. Comes up with a new set of IP addresses. Is it, It's not going to work, right? Unless you now submit a firewall request and wait two weeks for that thing to go through, right? So um, using even there's, there's baby steps we can take before we get to the, the nirvana of self-service policy. Um, things like making sure that as we write new policies, they're written based on identity attributes that the developers are already, you know, that are either already in place or the developers are already used to managing um, that allow us to dynamically apply the correct policy when a new workload spins up. Again, it's a process. Um, it's kind of an, an end state that I think everybody should be aspirationally, you know, you know looking for, but, um, but the end state should not prevent you from making in- incremental progress. And that's, uh, I think, important to keep in mind. Yeah, by by changing the binding property from, like you said, more traditional network uh, endpoint attributes to more of a tag based or or label based approach, um, I imagine that changes everything because, as you said, yeah, it's huge. Um, yeah, so and, and so this is independent of whether or not I'm containerized or I have functions as a service or as long as we take that label based approach. Now, I think separate. There's a separate discussion on on whether or not I trust that. Because I guess technically that's not a binding property; it's something I've assigned. But so, so maybe there's there could be malicious activity there. But, but at least by removing some traditional network attributes as that binding element, this changes the game. Um, and and there's nothing really. I have a solution for that other problem too. Like we think about this stuff. But yes, oh, this like is it. part of like being it. born in the cloud. But yeah, keep going. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I want to actually hear that part. Um, um, I, I'd love to hear some of your thoughts on it. Yeah. So tagging. Um, you're right. I get that question all the time. It's like, oh, well, the developer is managing their tag. What if the developer went in and changed their tag? And now they've yeah. got kind of a, a, a different priority. Well, it's important to note, um, there's kind of two sides to this. So one is uh, there's excellent precedent for zero trust architecture in um, in some of the work that NIST put out uh, with, 
with uh, their zero trust design uh, concept. And, and one of the things that is important to consider is um, separating out rights and where the, the identity attributes live from the machines themselves. So uh, if you think about the process of an exploit, right, and an attacker gets on the machine, that's not the same thing as the developer, right? The attacker does not have rights to change the tag of the machine because the machine, you know, the tag lives in, ex in an external system. But let's even assume that the developer is trying to be malicious and they want to change their tags. Um, it's not just that there's two things. One, we're not just looking at tags on workloads. We're also looking at tags on properties of workloads. So um, like uh, you are in this subnet or you are in this VNet or you are in this region or you're in this account, right? Oftentimes just having the ability to do micro segmentation doesn't mean you shouldn't also do segmentation at other layers of the stack. And so I talked earlier about how many, uh, you know, best practice for, um, for many uh, mature cloud organizations is to have multiple different accounts per application. An account is a property, it's an identity attribute, and you can write security policy based on what account a workload is in, right? And so there's 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 elements that we want the developers to be able to, to change to help with that dynamic nature of things, but we can also use identity attributes that the developers can't change um, to make sure that they're always in the right lifecycle policy, as an example, and aren't moving from dev to prod. So yeah, great, great. That's a uh, it's a good point. Yeah. No, that's a good that's a great answer too. Yeah. All right. Well, Chris, we've taken up a lot of your time, but this has been a very fruitful and enlightening uh, discussion. There is so much behind everything that you said. Uh, we hope our listeners took a lot out of this, and we're very much excited to be working with Aviatrix and learn and uh, sharing more about this with our own clients tackling these challenges in the cloud and uh and bringing the aviatrix uh, value proposition so thank you again for joining us yeah thanks, yeah Chris. my pleasure good to meet you guys and uh and and catch up and and let's do it again sometime yeah we'll welcome that thank you thank you yep thanks